Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, wherever you are. I hope you have had a good uh, conference so far. My name is Dr. Richard Muazzam. I will be moderating this uh, session that uh, is talking about uh, space communication or telecommunications. Uh, before, uh, before we go further, let's wait a couple of minutes to uh, allow other uh, audience, potential audience attend. Okay, and uh, we go ahead. Okay, I think uh, I think we can start. This session is telecommunications in a space. An agenda is uh, three uh, papers. Uh, at the beginning of the session, I, uh, as I said, I am Richard Moazam from American Public University Systems. I warm you up with uh, some information about uh, what we need in. Uh, educational systems or academia to catch up with the requirement for experts in, uh, in uh, telecommunication in the space. Then we got two very distinguished professors that they were kind enough to invite our, uh, to uh, accept our invitation to attend this. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Alan Johnston, from Villanova University speak about STEAM education outreach in uh, with the AMSAT, CubeSat SIM, uh, a low cost satellite simulators. And uh, then uh, Dr. Yahya Rahmat Sami, University of California, Los Angeles. Again, a distinguished professor there. Uh, is, will be talking about novel electromagnetic and antenna concepts for the next generation space enterprise. I hope uh, you are going to enjoy uh, this session and uh, without any uh, delay, let's go to uh, our first presenter. Okay, uh, first, as I said, I am talking about satellite communication technical study at APUS STEAM system. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Richard Moazam, associate professor at, uh, uh, at the university. And uh, I am talking about uh, what we um, propose to uh, be conducted in APUS to meet the requirement of the industry. Um, the agenda of my talk is, uh, I talk about satellite applications in civilian uh, mode or civilian sector. Then I talk about uh, satellite application in military, advances in semiconductors, then I talk about advances in satellite applications. Uh, I talk about 5G and 6G and satellite communications. Then I talk about aviation and satellite communication. I talk about 5G and its uh, domination in job market in future. Possibility of satellite mobile communication in mobile phones and why we as academy, academia, we need to go with the trend to serve the students and the university. Our, and I speak about our plan, uh, what we propose here. But, uh, first, I talk about background uh, companies and governmental sections. And they are launching approximately 50,000 satellites to provide 5G and Wi-Fi services everywhere on air, uh, which is itself is huge task. Elon Musk uh, SpaceX is leading this effort and they are planning to develop 42,000 Starlink satellites 
and uh, its goal is to establish a global network for uh, providing uh, internet and other services related to internet. In 2020, there were uh, in, the, in the satellite industry have had $275 billion revenue, which is a huge market uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, those development that we are, uh, we talk about that and we are going to talk. Uh, this uh, 271 billion, uh, the big sector of it is ground equ equipment. Uh, the operat operational satellite in 2020, there were around 3,371 satellites. 7% of that is military and rest commercial, governmental, and non-profit organizations. So uh, usually we think that um, satellites are related to military applications, but as you can see, only 7% of it is really military and the rest is civilian that, uh, that we, uh, we are seeing it. This is the information that I collected regarding $271 billion in 2020. And it's divided to different uh, and different sector of satellite uh, applications, and um, and it shows that it is cut all around uh, different things, but dominating by television, of course, because we use uh, the direct satellite, the TV in our homes and in many countries. Uh, if you need further information, you may go to these sites and they provide you with uh, further information regarding, uh, regarding the uh, distribution of these uh, revenue or, or income. And, uh, but you, the most important thing is, is in 2020, revenue was $135 billion. Uh, this is the... Uh, this uh, map shows the uh, market uh, in future and what market is and uh, the regional growth here highly in the green area, uh, mostly in Australia and uh, some parts of Asia. Uh, the uh, the uh, mid growth is North America and some part of Europe, and low growth is Ameri and South America and Africa. But as you can see, all of them are growing. So, uh, so in this industry is is really is growing all around the board, and uh, and uh, other things that I am talking about that uh, with that grow would be uh, rather new growing applications. Uh, internet service is the most important thing that uh, will be grow all around the world. And remote sen sensing, which is very, um, you, you see these days, one of the advantages of using this in some, uh, some area, like for example, earthquake and Volcanic, uh, volcanic activities or uh, some global war warming that you see that in Poland, that all is taken by satellites. Uh, providing the internet service to uh, countries that they are under uh, totalitarian rulers like South Korea and some other countries that they deprive their nation from uh, the, inf the free information. Uh, and then I think uh, it is the task of the developed country to provide the people over there with the uh, information uh, that we, benef we enjoy it here in uh, free world. Uh, remote sensing has expanded its applications to monitor and map the urban growth. Uh, even the city grow, the, the how, how forests are uh, being changed to become cities. And these are all uh, can be seen by 
by satellite image and images. A uh, growing application of satellite in environment, environmental science, public health and disaster management uh, that uh, help a lot these days for, uh, for people who provide services to, uh, to remove any catastrophic uh, issue uh, if they can. Uh, and these are growing in the satellite communication. Uh, there are possibility that the wireless sensor networks benefit from satellite communications in some hard reach places like uh, middle of ocean or on top of mountains in poles in other area that uh, they can use wireless sensor network, for example, to, uh, to investigate uh, how, uh, for example, tsunami is progressing. Uh, 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 in the ocean and warn people in, at the coast uh, that they uh, they may be suffering if uh, we are uh, they they are not informed uh, on time regarding the uh, wireless sensor network has got application in military a very abused one uh, in civilian sectors agriculture farming volcano volcanic activities. Uh, forest, wildlife, and progression of uh, tsunami, as I said. These are all uh, uh, sectors that uh, may um, use wireless sensor networks to, um, to, uh, to advance their, their services, their progress, their uh, products, and whatever you can think, even in farming, for example. Uh, but uh, satellite communication can encompass uh, the satellite uh, and the wireless sensor network to uh, expand the application of satellite in their uh, area in these areas. Uh, in, in this, besides all these things, semiconductor technology has improved and developed uh, in the last uh, decade. Uh, and these days, GAN or gallium nitride uh, can expand their application to high frequencies. And, and more importantly, they can provide a lot of power that, uh, that uh, increases the, the capability of the satellites and also the life of satellites. Um, I have to say that um, battery technology also improved. That, uh, that make the satellite communication uh, more um, economical and also more uh, much simpler. As an engineer, I enjoy using GAN rather than tubes and other things in satellite communication. Uh, there are rumors in the world that mobile phone will be benefiting from, uh, from uh, satellite communications. And I was hoping that, for example, iPhone 13 has the satellite communication uh, that, uh, and I was for, for one that I, I was going to buy it uh, just for that service because it gives me assurance in some area that, uh, that there is possibility that the no connection, at least we got emergency connection. I have this uh, service in my cars and I drive rural area very confidently. And, uh, and also I am a hiker, I enjoy hiking. And I, I always worry that I may not have got uh, connection in my mobile phone. So if, if a satellite uh, can encompass mobile phone or mobile phone provide that service to their customers, uh, it would be a giant leap uh, in this uh, in using the mobile phone and uh, and I, I go I like it I enjoy it but unfortunately it was postponed for time being but uh, but I am sure in future uh, our mobile phone will have connection with satellite as well uh, so all these things, uh, having all these things in our mind, we need to go, we, um, I mean, the academia need to go with the trend. So and they need um, 
uh, it is a growing need of qualified engineers, scientists, technicians, marketing and sales and management personnel in the field of satellite applications. Uh, and if it goes to mobile phone and also 5G, 6G, uh, this would be much uh, faster grow, growth in this demand. Uh, not many universities, unfortunately, are offering undergraduate or graduate degrees in this area, in the satellite communication area. So these trends and situation mandate that we, we as uh, academia, provide um, expertise in the field of satellite communication. Uh, we need to have graduate or undergraduate or whoever uh, be, be familiar with this field because there is a possibility that they will be absorbed by this market. Provide the industry the required forces. On, on the other hand, industry require, this, uh, require us to provide these forces. Enable our student, student uh, to fill these employment opportunities. This is opportunity for our students uh, to find the right job in future. And uh, so this motivation allows us that in, in a STEM uh, school of APUS, uh, we are suggest we have already in courses in microwave technology antenna, signal and system, digital signal processing that or are, can, or are or can be related to satellite communications. We are planning to offer some courses in the RF and communications in, the, in our um, school. RFs, uh, mainly RF circuit design, RF system design, it, which need uh, uh, to be uh, out uh, for engineer and also uh, we have we can have uh, some project courses using our uh, being installed radio telescope we are trying to uh, install a radio telescope that our engineer our student can uh, do some project on satellite communication uh, as a final project for their um, uh, their uh, plan of study. So uh, that uh, that radio telescope allowed them to do do so and then do some practical uh, uh, practical study or um, experience. Uh, and they measure they can measure uh, and the receiver characteristics, for example, with that. Uh, so um, we are proposed that to provide a, a certificate where. Uh, on the communication with satellite or satellite communication engineering. This, uh, this certificate allows uh, our current students and also it is open to external students to learn and gain a skill in the satellite uh, communication engineering. Uh, so this is the first phase that uh, I am proposing to our uh, institution to do so. Later, we can expand this concentration uh, in communication system and satellite applications. Uh, this would be within their bachelor degree. Uh, the concentration will serve our future student and train uh, uh, expert in the field for overgrowing demand for uh, engineers in the field of uh, satellite communication. Uh, we predict that we need to do, have future courses beside these courses due to growing application and the expansion of the market for satellite communication. These would be antenna system technology and mobile user terminal. If, for example, mobile phone are going to incorporate satellite, especially antenna is important uh, for these uh, devices. Um, remote sensing uh, um, regarding technology of that, regarding engineering of that, power and battery system. And uh, also because there are always concern about health hazard of these 
we need to uh, teach uh, our students regarding health standards and how these may affect the health of the people. Although personally, I, I don't think it is a big problem, but uh, always there are some speculation about that and we need to uh, address this. And, uh, and also radiation and high energy bombardment, which uh, can affect uh, some, uh, some people. Uh, this core, uh, also policy regarding using satellite need to be um, taught to a student and uh, at least whatever standards are available to be teach to our uh, we teach to our student to make them ready for the market regulation and management all these uh, um, allow us to uh, serve our student and our industry for this growing sector of technology. Uh, to summarize, uh, as I said, there is a growing demand for engineer, uh, scientists and technician marketing and management expertise in the field um, and application of satellite uh, are increasing in many sectors. And, uh, and if it goes to uh, a mobile phone, this uh, would be more um, more um, pronounced requirement. Also, 5G and 6G, as you know, the the guard sector that uses uh, uses the satellite to provide the communication. Uh, and also in aviation, for example, in the plane, we need to be able to communicate easily uh, by phone uh, by using satellite. Uh, these trends uh, allow us and require us and mandate us to uh, provide uh, and the uh, the education to our students uh, to be ready for that uh, market and also provide industry require uh, require forces that they need and it is proposed that we offering a certificate in satellite communication engineering first and then we can uh, expand it to uh, to concentration. This was uh, what I was going to convey. And uh, thank you for attending this part of the uh, session. Uh, if there is co any questions, Daniel, uh, we can uh, we can I can add, address it. If not, we may have got opportunity at the end of the session to address those. Uh, there, are, there are no questions right now, so we might just leave them at the end. Okay. Uh, okay, so next uh, next session, next part of the session uh, would be uh, done and presented by uh, Dr. Alan Johnston. Uh, let me give you a little uh, uh, a little bi biography about uh, our distinguished uh, presenter. And I am really pleased and honored to introduce them for, uh, for our session. Uh, and I am amazed how they, uh, they have done all these achievements. Uh, maybe one day I ask them to present us with uh, the idea how they managed to make 24 hours, 36 hours, and be able to do all these things uh, within a short period of time. But uh, going back to introducing Dr. Alan Johnston, uh, he has a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from University of Melbourne, Australia, and a Doctorate in Electrical Engineering from Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He worked for over 25 years in the telecommunications and internet communications industry. He is on the faculty of uh, Villanova University Electrical and Computer Engineering Department as an associate teaching professor, where he is the faculty advisor of the Villanova University CubeSat club and the amateur radio club. He also served as AMSAT's vice president 
for educational relations and is the lead of the AMSAT CubeSat SIM project. He has written five technical books. I repeat, five technical books is is amazing, and hold eighteen U.S. patents. Here you are, uh, Alan, and uh, we will be looking forward to uh, lis uh, listening to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm going to uh, be talking today about the AMSAT CubeSat simulator. And uh, I have some slides, but I'm going to try to spend most of my time doing some, doing some live demos here. Um, and there are also demos that, uh, that you can uh, participate in. Uh, so with this, with this project, I have a number of, uh, of co-authors, including uh, Pat Kilroy, Jim McLaughlin, and uh, David White. And uh, this, this project has been supported by the members of, uh, of AMSAT. So I, I thank them for their support over a number of years. So, uh, so these demos I'm going to do um, they will connect with this with this live um, SDR web um, uh, web SDR. So this link here, if you click on that in your browser, and you can even click on it on a on a phone, um, it will open here. I think I can put it into the into the chat here. I think that worked. I think that went to everybody there. Um, so if you click on that link, it will open, and uh, and that way you'll be able to see the radio signals that I'm. Uh, that I'm uh, transmitting here. So let's just have a glance here at it. So yeah, so this is, uh, this is what it looks like if, if you've looked at, uh, you've worked with SDRs, software defined radios, and, uh, and in particular web SDRs. So this is, a, this is what's known as a waterfall view. It's basically a time series showing the signals. And um, you can tune around by, by clicking uh, on, on here, and you can listen to different things. And if I take the sound off here, I don't know if you can. And so that's uh, that's uh, NOAA uh, weather radio broadcasting the the forecast for here in uh, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, but anyway, I I use these web SDRs when I'm doing demonstrations um, for students because it allows them to interact with the signals and tune them. Um, I'm going to switch the band here over to uh, to two meters. So this is the amateur radio two meter band uh, activity here. I'm just going to set it on packet here, um, and uh, and and let that run uh, while I present. Now it looks like a few of you have connected. I see the client shows five there. So hopefully some more of you will will click on the link and uh, and join. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm here uh, representing AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, and uh, they're a, uh, an educational not-for-profit that's been around for over 50 years and have been launching satellites for, for amateur radio and educational use um, uh, through, throughout that time. And it's a, it's a great uh, all-volunteer organization. Uh, and I, uh, I kind of got my start in my career um, uh, when I was a teenager, um, communicating with satellites built by by AMSAT, so it's a it's a great opportunity for me to to give back uh, to that. And, and AMSAT, as an organization, has a number of uh, educational outreach programs. They have uh, people called AMSAT ambassadors who demonstrate satellite technology to other hams and the general um, public. Uh, they're also involved in uh, in supporting ARIS, uh, amateur radio on the International Space Station. They arrange uh, live radio links between astronauts orbiting on the International Space Station and um, schools where the kids get to go to the microphone and ask questions uh, of the astronauts about life in space, uh, which is which is a really, really exciting thing. If you ever get a chance to to see one of those, it's it's really exciting uh, and, and great for um, for space education. Uh, AMSAT has a number of partnerships with universities for for building uh, building CubeSats and launching CubeSats. And also the uh, the CubeSat Sim project, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. So um, many of you are probably familiar with with what CubeSats are, but but uh, just in case, I'll just give a really quick quick um, introduction. Uh, it's basically a small 
nano satellite uh, developed for education, and they're designed to be low cost to build and low cost to launch. So they have this standardized shape of a, of a cube, and a 1U cube is just 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, pretty small, but you can make, you can make multiple. So you can make a 3U that's three times as big and a, and a 6U that's three times as long and twice as wide. So you can build some bigger, bigger things with it. Uh, and I have a couple of them orbiting here behind me on my, on my background, uh, courtesy of uh, ASA. Uh, and they're generally put into, into low Earth orbit, uh, typically around the range of the International Space Station or a little, or, or a little lower. And um, they're, they're built by universities, um, sometimes they're even built by high schools. And they're a great way for, to introduce uh, uh, space to, um, uh, to, to students and to, uh, and to school kids as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is not an actual CubeSat that, that, you would, that you would actually send to space, but instead a simulator. So it's like a satellite for your, for your desk, a satellite for the classroom. And uh, um, basically the idea is to, CubeSats are, are fairly low cost, you know, maybe, maybe $10,000, $15,000 to build one uh, to, to go to space. And, um, uh, but that's still out of the reach of many, many classrooms. That's still, still quite a lot of money. Uh, and of course, it's designed to survive in space. Um, so the, the simulator, it's, it mimics many of the functions of a real CubeSat, but it's, it, it does not go to space. It's not that, not that sturdy. It has a 3D plastic uh, printed frame, uh, very low cost components, Raspberry Pi, uh, uh, processor, things like that, but it demonstrates many of the many of the things uh, that, that that you can do with it. And in addition, we believe that the CubeSat simulator can be used by teams that are building actual CubeSats um, as as one of their uh, you know one of their steps, basically, uh, because sometimes um, first time builders of CubeSats they jump straight to building their flight model and they make mistakes and they don't fully understand how they're going to operate it and manage it and control it. And sometimes those missions fail after a lot, many years effort and, and a lot of money. And uh, so the CubeSat simulator is a way to, for, for teams to get experience and to really learn all aspects of, of a space mission before they actually um, start building their flight model and, and going from there. Um, and it's also, we think it's also a great way to do outreach with the, uh, with the amateur radio uh, community as well. All right, so the, the uh, CubeSat simulator or the CubeSat sim, as we'd like to call it, um, it's, uh, the, the processor is a Raspberry Pi 0W, which is just a, just a $10 little, little, uh, little CPU. But it's, a, it's basically a fully functional model of a, of a CubeSat, and it operates like it's in low Earth orbit. Um, it has uh, rechargeable nickel metal hydride batteries uh, and also working, working solar cells. They're, they're very inexpensive solar cells, um, so they, they don't really power it uh, for a full orbit kind of thing. Um, and it transmits real radio telemetry, which, which you're, we're going to see with the, um, with the web SDR as it transmits from my desk here, using a number of different modes, uh, including transmitting images too. Um, and uh, we, we do simulations with it where we put it on a rotating turntable in front of a lamp, and then it acts like a, like a, uh, like a satellite that's spinning in space. And you can, uh, you can get information from the sensors and you can see the solar panel voltages and currents uh, varying, and you can analyze it just like you analyze a real CubeSat, except it happens to be on your desk uh, in front of the classroom. So there's, um, we have two versions of the CubeSat sim, the, the, the full one and, uh, and the light. Um, the full one has, has three, different, uh, three different boards, and it only costs about $200 to build uh, and, and just requires basic, basic soldering. Um, it, was taking, it was taking my uh, freshman engineering students about uh, teams about 10 hours to, to, to build it, which is not too bad. Um, the CubeSat sim light, on the other hand, uh, it's just a single board, just the transmitter part, um, and uh, and it, it just it just transmits uh, simulated telemetry. Uh, so the main CubeSat sim, you get three boards that stack on top of each other. Um, the CubeSat sim light, it just plugs into a Pi like a Pi Zero, and uh, and off it goes. And then you can put them in a in a three D printed frame, um, and uh, and and off you go. 
Okay, so let's uh, let, let's do some do some demos here. Uh, we'll stop with the slides here. Actually, let me just check in on the. Uh, okay, not, not too many of you have joined the the uh, the web SDR here, so I'd encourage you to click on that link in the uh, uh, in the chat room there. But if you look at this, there's um, packets that are getting received. Uh, th these are uh, uh, amateur radio APRS packets, and they have different information. And if I click on them here, it's going to pull up a map of the area because uh, amateur radio. Oops, that was interesting. Uh, amateur radio APRS packets have uh, uh, have have GPS coordinates in them. So when we receive the signal, uh, we can plot where they are. So so this is this is where I live here in Philadelphia. And uh, that's uh, K3TU, that's Temple University. They have a, they have a digipeter that's just, just next to where I live here. Uh, but we can click on some of these other ones and see other, these are uh, stations. This is in Salem County, New Jersey. Um, this one's out towards, towards Villanova there. But these are all live signals um, that, uh, that have been received. So anyway, this, this application, it's, it's quite, quite good for education here. So I'm just going to switch modes with it here. Uh, and, um, and that way you can follow along with the, uh, with the live demo that I'm going to do. So if you're connected here, it's going to, to reload. Um, and I'm going to click on the CubeSat SIM here so that when it starts transmitting, um, we'll be able uh, to see it. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. So I'll show you my uh, my desk camera here. So so here is my uh, CubeSat simulator here. Uh, it's got the remove before flight tag still in, still inserted here, so we haven't launched it yet. Um, here is, here is the uh, circuit boards uh, that, that we use. I'm going to get a bit closer here. Um, so there's three of these circuit boards um, in order to build that are stacked inside here. Um, this is the CubeSat SIM light. It's just this single, single board here stacked on a, uh, on a Pi Zero, and you just power it up and it starts transmitting. Um, this is my ground station here. It's actually, uh, you can't really see it, but behind this screen is a, is a Raspberry Pi um, 4B. And the, the radio part of it is just an RTL SDR. This is just a USB radio dongle. These are amazing devices. It's uh, $20 and it gives you, uh, you can tune anything from, from one megahertz up to, um, I don't know, 1.8 gigahertz uh, with free software. It's amazing. So, so anyway, so this is my, my ground station here. Um, so why don't we go ahead and uh, actually, I'm just going to start the, uh, I'm going to start the web SDR on the ground station here. So I will get that, uh, get that going. And then I'm going to remove, take the remove before flight pin out here. And uh, so we're launching our CubeSat simulator. So this is a, oh, here we go. We got some radio static there. So tune here. So in about um, 30 seconds, the CubeSat simulator will, um, uh, will uh, boot up and it will uh, start transmitting. The first thing it will actually transmit is a, uh, is a Morse code identifier. Um, it's going to send hi, hi, DE, and then a call sign. There we go, that was it there. And uh, now it's gonna start uh, transmitting. And if you're watching on the, on the web SDR, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn DigiPeter off on that. Yep. So that is, you can see it there as well. All right. So we are, we are transmitting here and it's, um, it's actually transmitting a, uh, a, a telemetry signal. 
So it's, it's taking information about uh, basically housekeeping telemetry. So voltages, currents, temperatures uh, of, the, of the satellite itself. So instead of just listening to the signal, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to switch to running software called Fox Telem. And um, this is the software that AMSAT uses for monitoring and getting telemetry for our on-orbit CubeSats. Um, we, have a, we have about four uh, CubeSats uh, on orbit, and, uh, and this software we use to do it. The CubeSat simulator uses um, the same format. So you can see here, uh, actually is that, I if it's a good way to, I'm gonna switch here to, uh, to share the screen so you can see it a little better. Okay, hopefully you can see that. That's basically just the, that, that's a, just a close up of this, of this screen on my Raspberry Pi ground station here. So the software is running here. This red line here is the, um, is, is the spectrum. Um, so there's a peak here at 434.9 megahertz. That's the, that's the part of the 70 centimeter uh, amateur radio band where it transmits. And this is, uh, this is the eye diagram here, uh, which if any, any of you have taken a communications class, yeah, Richard's nodding, uh, you, you'll be familiar with the eye diagram, but it's basically a, you have a digital signal. You see, you see it here on the left with the two levels. And if you just superimpose the waveform on itself, um, if you have a nice open eye like that, it means you have a good digital signal. You have distinct high and low levels, basically ones and zeros. Um, and uh, so, so that says, and it says that we have nine, nine dB of signal to noise ratio, so it's good. And if you notice that the um, frames and packets counts at the bottom there are increasing. So we're, we're, we're decoding the data here. And if I click on the tab here, um, you'll notice the, the, um, uh, the, the number of payloads is increasing here. We get about one packet of data every four seconds from the, from the CubeSat simulator. And you see there's all kinds of, all kinds of data here, um, the battery voltage, solar, solar panel voltages, currents. Um, there's also a, what, what we call the STEM payload board um, on the top here. And it has some sensors, including temperature, pressure, altitude, uh, and um, humidity. So those are all, all being reported. So it looks like it's, um, it's about 24 degrees Celsius here in my room. Um, here's another temperature. This is the, this is the Raspberry Pi CPU temperature um, that, that's being reported. So it's, uh, that's what, 33 degrees Celsius. So that's a bit, that's a bit hotter, but it's still, still well within, within tolerances here. Um, so one interesting I, I thing I noticed when I was getting ready to do this demo, I was looking at this battery voltage here and I was thinking, mm, that's a bit high. And then I looked at the current and saw that it was zero. And I'm like, that shouldn't be zero, right? It should either be a positive current that the battery is supplying power or a negative current that it's charging. So I think, I think my, my CubeSat sim has suffered a, uh, some kind of anomaly here, which I need to investigate. But having this sort of housekeeping telemetry lets you identify issues, just like a real, a real satellite as it's orbiting. You get the data, and then um, hopefully you can figure out how to, how to work around it. Um, of course, being on my desk, I can just pull it apart and, and fix it. So it's uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit easier. Okay, so I'm going to switch modes here. Um, and there, there's a little push button on the side here that I used for switching modes. So I'm going to switch um, to image mode here, which is mode four. There we go, that is mode four. And uh, you can see the little Pi camera here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna aim it out the window here, just out my balcony, just so you can see see something interesting, hopefully. And um, I'm gonna switch in my ground station to to decode images. Uh, it, it transmits images with a format called SSTV or slow scan TV. So let's see what we have here. It's a little bit noisy. All right, I don't know if you can hear that, but it is, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's a, um, uh, it's, it's not a digital image, it's just an analog image where you're basically using frequencies to represent pixels as it goes, um, but you can see the image, uh, image filling in there, 
Um, this first one is just a just a um, just a stored image, um, and this is this is using a, a free free software called QSSTV. Um, one fun thing with um, uh, with uh, with these types of images, um, a few times a year, the International Space Station transmits slow scan TV images using their amateur radio gear, and it's a lot of fun because. Uh, they, they announce it and, and hams and, and also just listeners all over the world um, try to decode them. They'll, they'll do like 15 pictures and rotate them. And so each time the ISS flies over, people try to capture, capture the images uh, from the ISS, which is a lot of fun. All right, so that's the first image coming through. And um, now it's going to, going to transmit a second image. And if you're watching on the uh, on the web SDR, um, you can uh, uh, you can hear the signal. If you had the software, you could also decode the images too. All right, so here is the second image, which is coming. So far, it's just blue sky. All right. Lots of blue sky. It is a it is a clear day here in Philadelphia. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So that's basically it for the for the CubeSat Sim demo here. There's there's a couple of other modes. There's a Morse code mode. Um, there's a binary phase shift keying mode, and there's also a a, a digital uh, APRS packet mode as well, um, which which can be uh, can be demonstrated. There we go. Now we can see. See my balcony railing there, and uh, and a few things. Okay. All right. So a couple more slides, and then we'll uh, we'll do any uh, any questions. Uh, that you might have. And I will just mute the actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch modes here. Switch to one other mode just so so those of you uh, following along can can hear. Okay, so back to the presentation. So I mentioned the the stem payload board, which has a bunch of sensors on it. It's got a, an Arduino uh, controller, um, and uh, uh, and it's got a uh, three-axis gyro accelerometer and a pressure, temperature, humidity sensor, and a little area where you can add your own sensors as well. Um, and uh, and people are experimenting with with um, putting these boards on a on a uh, on a weather balloon on a high altitude balloon. Uh, and, uh, and and transmitting that way. Uh, so this this slide um, shows you what uh, in Fox Telem you can graph telemetry uh, over a period of time, and this shows the simulated telemetry um, with the with the current peaks and the voltage peaks, and showing the simulated illumination and um, uh, and eclipse where you're in sunlight and and when you're uh, when you're not. So AMSAT also has a program um, where uh, where teachers or hams can can basically borrow a loaner kit for doing demonstrations in their classroom. Um, but all the plans for the CubeSat Sim it's fully open source. Everything is on uh, is on GitHub, um, and so so you can uh, you can build them, uh, build it yourself for for a few hundred dollars. Um, you can also get the the, the boards. Um, we have some at, at AMSAT where you can get the boards. Um, instead of having to have them uh, have them fabricated yourself. Um, so the, the different ground station options, I've been showing the, the Raspberry Pi one because I, I like that one, but you can also just use a um, use a PC. And the uh, this is the, the software that we use on the uh, on the Aris Radio Pi 
um, for doing that. So anyway, so, um, so if you're interested in the CubeSat simulator, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we, have a, we have a Twitter account, CubeSat Sim, uh, hashtag CubeSat Sim for, for things you're doing with it. Uh, and I'm happy to, to help out, um, get, it into your, get it into your classroom. Um, there, a number of universities use them for like freshman uh, courses for, um, for, for just building expertise and then redesigning for, um, for more, more senior uh, classes as well. So, so yeah, so, so thank you for your, uh, for your time and for the invitation um, to, to speak here. Um, on our website, there's a number of papers uh, that have, have uh, details uh, on the CubeSat simulator. So I will, I will turn it back to Richard and uh, I can answer any questions now or uh, at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was amazed and I was stunned. I couldn't say anything. I just wanted to listen what you are telling us. And it's really, I remember when I, when I undergraduate, we were happy to make a kit uh, for Radio FM. You made it so easy that we can do satellite with your uh, simulator and other, other uh, associated things. Uh, we got uh, some questions, but unfortunately, we are short of time for time being. I want to make sure that Yaya yeah, got enough time as well. If we got extra time, we address the questions. But anybody who has questions, we can, can contact us and, and by email, and we address it. Uh, having said that, uh, um, Alan, I think it is useful for our students as well. I am sure in future, we can uh, cooperate between your university and ours. And we provide the student with some, uh, some at least doing experiment with satellite, as you show us. Uh, it is itself is educational uh, regarding the spec uh, the specification and result is is good uh, learning for. Them. Okay, now let's go to our third uh, uh, presenter, Dr. Yaya Rahmat Sami. He is a distinguished professor. The he is. Uh, C Department, UCLA, University of California, uh, Los Angeles, a holder of the Nor Norman Trump um, Chair in Electromagnetic, a member of the U.S. Uh, uh, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the former ECE Department Chair, UCLA, and a former senior research scientist with the. Caltech slash NASA GPL. Uh, he was the 1995 president, president of the IEEE Antenna and Propagation Society and 2009-2011 president of the United States National Committee of URSI. He also uh, served as an IEEE distinguished lecturer presenting lectures internationally. He has had pioneering research contribution, uh, research contribution in the diverse area of electromagnetics and antenna with over 1,000 technical journal and conferences paper, uh, 35 books, chapter, and seven books. He has more than 20 cover page IEEE publication article he is the designer of the IEEE Antenna and Propagation Society logo, which is displayed on the on all the IEEE AP-S um, S publications. This is a brief uh, bio of Dr. Rahmat Sami. I am really um, honored that we have him here. And uh, uh, in advance, I thank him for accepting our invitation to present his paper. Yeah, yeah, is yours. Your mute. Your microphone is mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You are. Uh, I'm, you I'm are mute. Muted. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, very good. So let me first thank the uh, organizer, particularly Dr. Richard Moazam for his invitation, and also Mr. Daniel Gortierez for his uh, <clears throat> really very helpful assistance to get these things going. 
Now, uh, I entitled my talk to be Novel Electromagnetic and Antenna Concepts for the Next Generation uh, Space Enterprise. And you'll see a lot of pictures here, so I try to relate to them here and there as my talk progresses. I'm Yaya Ramat Sami, Distinguished Professor, Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of California, Los Angeles. So, right. So since we are talking about the space, I bring you from solar system to where UCLA is, from uh, solar system to Earth, to USA and Southern California, and we are located in a nice part of the Los Angeles. And we can always guarantee that we have a good sunshine when you visit us. And I would encourage you to do visit us and see what our campus is all about. Now, uh, greeting from UCLA. It just happened that last four years, uh, UCLA has been ranked number one public university in the US. And that's based on US News and World Report. And also, these are two iconic buildings of UCLA, Royce Hall and Power Library, which I encourage you to visit us. Now, my talk has several components. Of course, depends on how much time we have. I'll give you a little bit of introduction about electromagnetics, but not equation in a broad sense. What are all antennas are all about? We've heard the great talks from the previous speakers, but I'm going to be focused on component on the antenna part and electromagnetics. Then we look at some novel antennas for CubeSat, small cell planetary mission, if time permits, and some more advanced areas like metamaterial infusion into the more advanced technology. If you go to my website, my website is, uh, you can find it easily. One of the goal of our website is fostering creative research in modern electromagnetics communication and antennas. I'm the director. Our vision is to attract the best and most motivated students, publish enduring scientific papers, create visibility by active participation, and develop partnership with industrial and governmental agencies. So here you see my picture in the lap of Einstein. This is when I got the uh, NAE uh, membership, National Academy of Engineering. But the point of this picture is the statement that Einstein says. If at first an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. And that's the really a kind of work that I'd like to do in my lab in collaboration with my students. Let's find ways to collaborate if this forum allows us to take us to the next level. So here we start with the nice picture of uh, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who was the one that who actually got us the electromagnetics and his four equations. So my lab, we do a lot of mathematical work, a lot of simulation, but at the same time, we like to build things and measure them and all that. So it encompasses all aspects of electromagnetics and antennas. I strongly believe tremendous amount of knowledge is hidden in these equations by just playing with them and understanding where the pieces of the puzzles are, we can unravel a lot of hidden stories. For example, we all know that these four equations predicted the existence of EM waves traveling with the speed of light. And uh, I strongly believe these four equations forever change how we live, play, and enjoy life. So in my courses, I give a lot of uh, attention for students to fully appreciate the hidden mystery of this equation, even though it looks to be mathematically scary. But in, once you understand what the pieces are, it becomes a lot easier to play with them and discover new things. Now, when you have the Maxwell's equation, you have to go beyond that. So in the spirit of the recent Olympics, I put them in the five Olympic rings. These are computational optimization techniques, electromagnetic visualization, performance measurements and diagnostics, and ultimately allows us to do antenna characterization and novel antenna designs that we see some example. Our work covers all aspects of electromagnetics from the interaction of electromagnetic waves with human, antenna measurement and uh, satellite application and remote sensing and so forth and so on. Now, we also do a lot of work in optimization because nowadays, because of the power of computers, you can design these antennas even a lot more effectively by defining what you need to do. In my lab, we work on three aspects of a, a nature-inspired optimization method. One is a genetic algorithm, which is based on survivability and fittest using Darwinian evolutionary concept. The other one is particle storm optimization, 
which is uses the communication among species and collaboration. You can see the dynamics between these two methodologies are very different. Here is all competition, here is all collaboration. And lastly, brainstorm optimization, which relies on the ideas and leadership as the human try to solve problem among themselves. So we use these tools to do all kinds of elaborate designs. So you may ask, uh, who, are, who is the antenna scientist and engineer? I try to give you a little bit of feedback if some of you haven't played with antennas. I consider us antenna scientists and engineers and artists who we use the antennas of brushes to paint electromagnetic waves. And that's what the antenna is all about. It's like a brush to paint electromagnetic waves. So here you have a Van Gogh and in bottom you have me. So these are his paintings and these are some of my paintings. So you, I can challenge you at least I think my paintings perhaps are as beautiful. Some of you may not agree, but that's the direction we look in order to excite students then what the antenna is actually doing. So if you look at the, in the big picture, what is it all about? Antennas are really the device to radiate and receive electromagnetic waves. That's the only components that they deal with this mysterious electromagnetic waves. And they can come in all kinds of form and shapes. I think uh, 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 Alan showed some simple dipole antennas, but here I'm showing a lot more sophisticated antennas. They could be a sophisticated reflector antenna, lenses, you name it, or a reflector. Right? You see some example. But at the end of the story, you have some power or signal comes to the antenna, either in the receive mode or transmit mode, an antenna try to radiate that signal into space or receive them. The relationship between this exit aperture wavefront of the antennas and what we call the far field, what the radiated field is all about, is Fourier transform. It's really amazing when you look at the mathematics of it. So nature performs Fourier transform for you automatically. So for example, your flashlight is an optical antenna. If you look at your flashlight, you have a bulb in the in the focal point of your uh, mirror, I and mean, your mirror is parabolic uh, dish, if you wish. And so it is a kind of optical antenna because then it's able to radiate this light wave to far distances because of these focusing characteristics. Now, uh, last night you have a very good example. I was here and Dr. Albin uh, presented this uh, 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 observatory of the university and he showed, saw, he, he showed us beautifully last night, then you can see Jupiter and the three of the Galilean uh, moons. So again, these are optical telescopes, but in essence, they are another class of antennas if you look at them in the broader picture. So of course, electromagnetic covers a wide spectrum of frequencies. We typically refer to spectrum, which is a visible light or infrared part of the light that we call them optical or infrared telescope. And this is the James Webb a telescope that hopefully will be launched by the end of this year. But we not only work in the visible light, but we also work in many other frequencies. So this is a millimeter wave telescope, which I say one or two words about it. People typically don't call them telescope, but in essence they are, but they're in different frequency regimes. So if you look at it more broadly, from electromagnetic point of view, these are antennas operating at different frequencies. So now, for example, this is the uh, W map Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, which I was involved in it. This is done by Princeton and Goddard, NASA Goddard, and this was very successful mission launched in 2001, and it was a very highly sensitive antenna system or telescope system, if you wish which work at many frequencies, in, in, including millimeter waves. And the objective was to go back as close as possible to Big Bang, to look at the anisotropy of the radiation, and from that estimate what the actual uh, age of the universe is. And we believe that age of the universe now is 13.7 billion years within 1% accuracy because of these kind of instruments. So antenna is playing paramount role and our lab does all kinds of things related to that. And of course, I've already referred you to the James Webb, which I believe one of the most expensive is last 10 years they've been working on it. And we all hope that this area gets launched and it works on infrared 6.5 meter and hopefully sees even more deeper into the beginning of the universe. Now we had a, a great discussion about CubeSats. I probably have 
some uh, one or two words about it. And uh, the whole point that this cubes had got so much attention is this shrinking of electronics and required power dramatically allowed us to use a smaller satellite. So they ranged them from 500 to 100 kilogram minisat, the microsat, and the nanosats that the CubeSat belongs to this regime of nanosat. And when you look at the infusion of this technology, you will see them in commercial segment very strongly these days, military universities and all that. Of course, uh, there are also a lot of usage now for scientific and communication applications. Already you heard about the uh, unit U, so I showed them a little bit differently. So unit U is a 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. A lot of recent designs are trying to look at 1.5 U, 2.5 to 3 U, so which means that 25 centimeter, 10 and 10, which is almost the size of a bottle of wine. But for us, this is a very confined area because we are looking for big antenna to be positioned into this small volume and hence the name CubeSat, the genie in the bottle. Why do I call it genie in the bottle? Because now you see shortly, we're looking antennas almost the size of one meter to package it in this such a small volume for high data rate and for scientific imaging. So that requires extremely challenging antenna designs and uh, for high gain applications. So we recently, uh, I edited uh, a special issue of the Antennas and Propagation magazine. I was guest editor. The whole issue was devoted to the uh, CubeSat antennas and, uh, and what, where the technology is going, what is the future. So I encourage you to look at this issue if you are interested in. We wrote a review paper entitled For Satellites, Think Small, Dream Big. And uh, these are some of the satellites that I participated and has been built and many of them have been launched for remote sensing application, either 0.5 meter at 35 gigahertz or one meter at 35 gigahertz, high data rate, reflector rate, and for planetary missions. For the first time, these class of uh, CubeSats have been used for planetary missions. One example I'd like to bring to your attention was this one, the vision is to demonstrate deployable high gain reflector antennas for future CubeSats. So we like to package an antenna with the size of 0.5 meter, which gives you about 42 dB gain, which is pretty directive uh, uh, beam, and package it into 1.5 U. So this was a pretty challenging task and it was done between uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and UCLA collaboration. And this is what this antenna is all about. It is a mesh deployable antenna. It's a Cassegrain design. And this whole thing collapses into this small, uh, let's say, canister. The canister is about 1.5 U. And in the process of deployment, the antenna comes up and it's a double hinge, it deploys and deploys, ultimately goes to the full size. And uh, it has been very successful design for NASA and is already in orbit. And it was deployed from, uh, uh, space station about two years ago. One point to be emphasized due to the fact that it has to be packaged, so it cannot be a solid surface. These are mesh surfaces. This, the material is a, a gold-plated molybdenum or gold-plated tungsten, and with the opening about uh, 40 openings per inch in order to reduce transmission at this high frequency of 35 gigahertz through the holes of the mesh. But all of them, we are nowadays able to analyze very accurately, mathematically, and through simulation and ultimately measurements. As a matter of fact, a patent was issued for this design. And uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the bottom part of the slides. That shows the antenna deployment sequence on orbit, July 29, 2018. So there were camera on the CubeSat when this antenna was deployed from. And in the process of deployment, the photos were taken. You can see the Earth is in the background. And uh, there is a new version of this now, bigger one, but totally different design because this design could not be enhanced to bigger size. Now we are looking dimensions like one meter and three meter and so forth and so on, primarily for remote sensing application from orbital CubeSats and looking towards the Earth. And again, all of these missions are going on. I serve as a PR for NASA 
for this particular project. Again, for some of you who want to get a little bit of appreciation of what's going on, we go beyond just uh, modeling and simulation, things get built. We had collaboration with the company, Tendec LLC, and then the antenna brought to the antenna range at JPL and measurements were performed. What I'd like to emphasize here, when you compare simulation and measurement, we get very close agreements. That demonstrates that now the starting from Maxwell's equation, evolving it to the numerical tool and optimization method, you can actually design these things very accurately, including the effect of the fact that the surface is not solid surface and it's mesh surface. And this work appeared on the cover page of the proceedings of the IEEE uh, that we had some articles in that particular, uh, particular thing. So I probably am uh, a little bit behind because we, from my starting point, <laughs> I started late. So I jump on some of the things. Now I wanna just, bring another uh, advancement in the antenna domain. And this is a concept of reflector ray. So I consider reflector ray to be a marriage between reflector and classical array antennas. So this is shows the uh, scene from Bali. And here comes our reflector and here comes our array. And together they create this chai become a reflector ray, which is, I believe is very, uh, has a very bright future. And uh, uh, why that is the case? Because when you look at the parabolic dishes, as you see here, typically you have the feet at the focal point. And because of the geometrical shape of the parabola, you see this path length, total path lengths are the same. So therefore you get a coherent exit phase and then you get very nice speed. But now the question is that, can I get the same performance, but from a flat surface? So clearly you can't. If you just have a flat surface, if you look at these path rays, these path rays don't sum up the same as they do here. So therefore, in order to make this functional, we inject some uh, material into the interface of the flatness. And by that, we can control the phase of reflected wavefront. So together, then we get performance very similar to this. And indeed, these concepts have been used. For example, if you look at it, this example, this is a, uh, CubeSat, which went to Mars, and uh, you can see it made from panels, and this is flat using this concept that I'm referring you to, and at the end, it gives you very good performance, and before the deployment, this panel hugs this uh, CubeSat, for example. So this shows the prototyping in my lab and proof of concept. We always go through mathematics, all the simulations, all those details, but at the end of the day, we build them and we measure them. Now you can see this flat surface because of its particular design and because of the way we uh, put these pieces into the surface in order to control the face, we get very nice uh, beams that typically you expect from good antenna performance for far distance communication or imaging. And this is the antenna which I was talking to you. So you can see now in details, these are the panels. You can see all the little things here. All of them were designed and optimized in order to make the total path length to be the same, to give you a very good performance. As a matter of fact, this, the, for the first time, this uh, uh, CubeSat were used uh, as a mission to Mars. There was a mission to Mars referred to as uh, InSight, and there was a landers which went to Mars. And uh, uh, along the lander, there were two of these uh, reflector ray, uh, let's say CubeSat, which followed the lander. And the goal was that when the lander gets to the seven minutes that we don't get much understanding what is going on, is the lander hitting the ground and uh, uh, you know exploding or a lander is safely landing on Mars and so forth. So these two little uh, CubeSat satellites follow the landers and they were able to send the photos just to see what happened. Fortunately, the mission was successful and it landed uh, in a healthy fashion. So two CubeSats with reflectory antennas followed the lander, providing an almost real-time information about the landing sequences. And again, in that special issue that I edited for someone who might be interested in, there are a good uh, paper discussing the features of this particular design, the deployable high-gain antenna bound for Mars. For maybe uh, another uh, one or two minutes, maybe another thing of interest for this 
forum because we're talking about space. And that is the work that we did and hopefully in the future could be used on the moon or on the Mars to creating a direct link from the rover to Earth and then from the astronauts to rover to Earth. So this is a notion of enhancing communication for future Mars rovers. And as you know, uh, every two years, Mars and Earth, they come close to each other. And that's the time we typically launch our spacecraft towards the Mars. Last July, uh, three spacecraft were launched towards the Mars, and that's typically what happened. But what is of interest to us, how to create communications? Usually the communications from uh, rovers are done to an uh, orbiting uh, satellite, and that orbiting satellite connects to antennas on the Earth. But then, uh, of course, still that is going on. But now the trend is, is it possible to have a direct link communication from the uh, rover to the Earth? So on the Earth, we typically have three stations. One is a Barstow, California, Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, that we keep connectivity all the time with our satellites or rovers and whatever. And the goal was that to create this connectivity directly with these rovers. And uh, we were engaged in this project with JPL and we came with some innovative design that of course we don't have time to go through them. And it was kind of a hybridized concept. It was a mechanical platform for pointing and then this uh, array design that we innovated for creating enough gain to create a data rate which is acceptable between the rover and Mars. Of course, some of these uh, concepts are still being evaluated for future Mars mission and potentially maybe even the moon mission. And uh, so let me don't go through, well, maybe just say one or two words. We use this uh, particle storm optimization to do our antenna design. The reason I'm bringing this up because this paper I co-authored with the undergraduate student from physics department and it was published in 2004. And this was one of our most successful papers over 2,400 citation. This is Google Scholar citation. But the point being that they, when you get our younger students engaged in some exciting uh, topics, they can really contribute very significantly. And this is a really a very good example of that. So we use that the particle storm optimization. We came with this design that we call the half E. So I'm not going through details of that because it has a lot of uh, unique Characteristic. It was small, it was circularly polarized, it was broadband for this particular communication link between Earth and the rover. And this shows some of the development in our uh, antenna range capability. We developed them, we prototyped them, students get engaged in doing all this detail. We measure them in our chambers to show if the performance is acceptable or not. This particular one was uh, very exciting design. And again, fortunately, they gave us a patent on that. So if anybody is interested, I encourage you to look at the patent. A lot of details are demonstrated in these patents. And also, we believe uh, these kind of work can potentially be utilized in this uh, new project for NASA, uh, which is called Artemis. Artemis. And uh, so we should be able to get engaged, hopefully, in some of these activities because there are similar stories. There are rovers, there are astronauts, and there's Earth. You want to keep communications. So okay. now uh, let me see uh, how are we doing. Uh, yeah, do I have yeah. another two, three minutes, or should I stop here? I think um, the net uh, two stop minutes here at most. I'm sorry, I, I have to I, I open the, the closing session. So two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Okay. So another area that uh, I think it was referred to is the fact that the almost 40% of humanity doesn't have any connectivity. And this is one of the areas that we are very interested. And these are now uh, getting a lot of attention. Of course, we heard about Elon Musk, uh, what he has done, but we are also very interested in that. Particularly, it's very important because these uh, vehicles or these uh, satellites, they, they move around. So you have to have an agile beam to keep connectivity. So like SpaceX works in this platform of satellites, small satellites, we are interested to work in this platform, which are the CubeSat, much smaller. And uh, these uh, platform necessitates very exotic antenna design. So I don't, we don't have time to go through that, just to let you know that we are using this notion of the material concept to develop some really uh, 
innovative antennas to be able to package and the CubeSats for these kind of missions. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we have books on these things recently published for those who are interested. So this shows what is it all about. It is a very unique design because of this metamaterial concept. And this design allows you to make a switchable and move the beams electronically, not mechanically, which is very desirable when you deploy them on the CubeSat. And these are gives you some potential deployment mechanism either deployed physically or mounted on the, on the uh, CubeSats, and then you deploy the feed, which allows you to create a receive or transmit operations. So great. So uh, uh, the, I don't go through the remote sensing here. I had the two uh, pictures here, but let's don't worry about that right now. These are another areas that we have a lot of interest for remote sensing. And uh, so maybe I finish with this statement here. So uh, I always uh, bring this up uh, uh, to my students and to other people. It is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And this is a statement by the Garner, which is the, uh, the key uh, scientist uh, for a rocketry in the US. This statement embodies the joy of outside the box engineering design in my lab. Much appreciation should go to my students. We always get a group photo when we go to conferences. It is immensely rewarding to work with talented students and see how they develop and grow in their professions. So with that, uh, maybe I stop. And again, thank you very much. Uh, for giving me the time and I enjoyed this session very much and I hope we can stay in touch and take it to the next level. Again, thank you very much to the organizer. Okay, thank you very much, Yaya, because we are short of time. Unfortunately, we are, don't have time to uh, raise the questions. There are some questions received, but uh, I think people can contact you Thank you, you everybody. Uh, yes, we're, we're, we have the closing remarks uh, right in uh, two, three minutes. So I'm going to close the session and please join us at the closing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.